do? I got out of the Marines in December 45 and January 46 I was in law school. And the whole class were all veterans. <laughs> and some of them didn't have civilian clothes yet. Wow. Yeah. I'm just going to get more formal. He got some of that, but we want to go through it just one more time to get it started. Just, would you just state your whole name and that you enlisted in the Marine Corps? Beg your pardon? State your name, again, yeah. and that you were enlisted in the Marine Corps. Okay. Uh, my name is James P. O'Donnell, and I was uh, a senior at Cornell at the time of World War started. And on February 11th, 42, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Now, be, interrupt there. What I'd like to get into the record was um, there's a boy from Ilium, Joe Seymour, big Seymour family, and he enlisted the same day as I did. And we went to Paris Island together, and uh, we were in the same platoon in boot camp. And when we got out of boot camp, they sent us to New River to join the first division or the first Marine Division, the Fifth Regiment. And strangely enough, we were put in the same company, D Company. But unfortunately for Joe, he was sent to a machine gun company. I was sent to a, a 81 mortar. And on November 1, 1942. He was killed, and yeah, that's the luck of the draw. If they reversed it, he'd be here. I'd be pushing up Kunai grass in Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how your service went after you enlisted. Uh, if, after we left, if we got to New River, I, uh, we were only there for a short time because they took the whole 5th Regiment to Norfolk, Virginia to board a, the Wakefield ship. And they took us down the East Coast through Panama Canal out to New Zealand. Took them about four or five weeks to do that because they didn't have any escorts. They just had PT boats coming out of Panama. And uh, we got to <coughs> New Zealand and uh, uh, we weren't in New Zealand more than four, week, four or five weeks, all the time taking the supplies out of the, uh, the big ship and putting them into attack transports. And then uh, we left New Zealand and uh, landed on Guadalcanal on August 7th, 1942. And this was the first invasion by American troops of World War II. Well, as a young man, what was that like? Hmm? Uh, was that like? Are you getting that or not? Yep, we're getting it fine. I just wanted to pull yeah. that up. Am I too mouthy or too no. noisy? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but any of it, uh, we got, I got through uh, Guadalcanal in good shape. What was that like? You were a young man, the very first invasion. What was that like for you? Apprehensive. I won't say we were scared, but we were apprehensive. Yeah, we never did because uh, when we first arrived there, uh, they, they, we didn't get too much opposition on the beach. Once we got ashore, we put a perimeter around Henderson Field, and the hero of Henderson Field was a Marine flight fighter pilot who just died this last year, Joe Foss, and we used to worship those guys. <laughs> they the only protection we had was they had already, the Japanese had pretty well uh, knocked our uh, fleet out. We sunk a lot of them down there. And, uh, but I was, uh, well, it, we didn't have any f food to speak of. We had two meals a day. And fortunately, uh, we had we captured a lot of Japanese food. We were Jap eating Japanese rice for uh, quite a while at a time. And then after we left Guadalcanal about in December, we went to 
Melbourne, Australia to recuperate. 95% of the division had malaria. And uh, then after leaving Australia, we went up to New Guinea, prepared to go to the Cape Gloucester. Uh, and when we got to Cape Gloucester in New Britain, uh, I was shot through the left arm. I was running a wire from uh, the gun placement up to the OP. And uh, then I was out of uh, New Britain for a while and then came back to my outfit. And uh, shortly after that we went, I was sent back to the United States. I didn't go back, and then I was in Quantico uh, with the training battalion. And I got an opportunity to go to OCS, and I was commissioned in the Marine Corps in, in August of 1945. And the war was coming to an end, you see, then. So they didn't want us, we were reservists at the time, they didn't want us in the service. You had to, to go to any other further schools. So I got out of the Marine Corps on the uh, 17th of December. 1945, and uh, was admitted in the Albany Law School in January 46, the, the very next month. And uh, I attribute an awful lot to, to uh, the Marine Corps, so far as discipline is concerned. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, we were plain like these kids do here, but we were more serious about things. And that's pretty well sums it up about my career in the Marine Corps. But you saw this, uh, you saw action and you had to be in places that were... Beg your pardon? You saw action and... I saw a lot of action. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell but just strangely enough, you see, we were brand new uh, out of the, in the Marine Corps. And we came to, went into this division. And I didn't even see a mortar fired until I got to Guadalcanal, you see. So we weren't, we had experienced guys with us, so. And I was gonna tell you about, going back to Joe, Joe uh, Seymour being killed on uh, November 1, <coughs> every one of his squad members were killed uh, in that action, except a corporal, Tony Casamento from Brooklyn, and he received the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is the highest honor you can get. Well, he saw his friends all killed. What about you? What about the friends that you made? Beg your pardon? What about your friends that were... Uh, made, a lot, made a lot of friends, but uh, you, you go, go get away from them after a while because they're all spread out all over the country. Yeah. Yeah, but... What was uh, the most difficult part of being at war for you personally? You know, strangely enough, you know, in today's age, they're questioning this and we're questioning that. In those days, they didn't question it. They accepted it as a fact. And, uh, but, uh, no, I... Uh, what was the hardest part for you? The hardest part? Oh, gee, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what that would be. When you came home, tell me about when you came home. You went to law school. Wasn't that a big change? Uh, to well, it was a big change, but everybody in the class were ex-servicemen, you got to realize. We were four years older than uh, most people start going to law school. And as a result, gosh, I, I ran across good friends of mine in law school. Yeah, we all were confronted with the same situation. But, um, no, no. What do you think young people should know about the war? What they should know what about the war? Know. Pretty hard to say what you would tell them now. Yeah, pretty difficult to say. 
What got you through your childhood? I think the young people would be just as able and just as dedicated as the people in World War II when confronted. Probably smarter, too. <laughs> but it's true, though. You think about it. No. What, uh, when you, after you, uh, you got your law degree, tell us about what life was since then. Oh, we got the law degree and I went to practice law in my father's office here for a little while. And uh, practiced for about uh, 20 years. Then I was elected to uh, New York State Supreme Court. And it was Supreme Court, the resident Supreme Court judge here in uh, Herkimer County for 22 or 25 years. Yeah, which I enjoyed very much. Yeah, and the fact I had a veteran's background like that helped me greatly in, in achieving that, you see. Yeah. Did you have a family? When, your family? What do you mean? Did, did you have a family of after you came back? Oh, yeah. yeah I, get I was married and, and had three children. Yeah. What did you tell your children about your experiences? I used to tell them, but they were not interested too much. Strangely enough, my grandchildren are more interested than my son would be. Yeah. I don't know why, but they, that's the way they are. What yeah. do you tell them? I tell them uh, the, the type of hardship you have and what you, what you can achieve. Tell, tell me the type of hardship to make sure I pass it on to my children. Huh? <laughs> you don't eat very well, and you you can't believe uh, what the human body can do. Now I used to carry an eighty-pound uh, mortar or base plate, either way, while I was an enlisted man, and we'd carry them up and down these ravines with kunai, kunai grass oh, up over your shoulder. And you wonder, in an awful heat, because we were in the tropics, you see, and you'd be running out of water halfway through the day and function without anything to drink. But it was, uh, that's very difficult. But what? you know a thing about when you join a military unit like that, you will run across uh, people from all walks of life. And you get a, you'll get a benefit from that because were you not, you only are living with a certain group of people. But you no, know, I, it it's, was fascinating. As the saying goes, I wouldn't give a million dollars to do it again, but I wouldn't give a million dollars for the experience too. Now, yep. my wife says to me, she said, You're, I'm constantly, she is constantly fighting the war in the South Pacific, as I've told her so much. Yeah. Did you feel the need to talk it out? Did you feel the need to share that? No, I didn't have, I didn't have uh, any feeling like some uh, young people have of oh, having nightmares afterwards. You know you've killed people, but I don't. You didn't know them, so you don't associate with them. It's part of the war. So how did you? Uh, it sounds like you had a, an inner strength at that time. What kind of? Where do you think you drew your strength from? Well, I don't know what that would be. <laughs> if I knew that, I'd be a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a judge. Right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, no. But I, uh, I gave the criminal justice lab upstairs here in honor of my father and my uncle. Yeah. And I was active. I was a county attorney at the time they built this institution. And. Uh, I'm proud of that experience. They gave me some an award, you know, for, for that. 
but you've given so much to the community, but you also gave so much to uh, our world. To our well, I think I think people, when you get a benefit like benefits that I've had in the community, you can, you're supposed to give something back to them, frankly. My wife does all the while. She's active in a nursing home and the Central Association of the Blind and stuff like that. But her dedication puts a lot of time in it. Yeah. When you left, when you went to war, and your family, your parents were back here, mm -hmm. uh, how did, what was that like for you to be away from them? Did you keep contact, that type of thing? Oh, I assume you're, I assume we're lonesome because uh, we'd never been, I'd never been away f uh, like you would be in the service. Uh, I, I remember when uh, when I got to New River, we were going to have a short leave, 72 hours. Well, I took advantage of it, and I was on the train for 62 of the hours. And I was in Herkimer 10 hours, that's all, out of 72. That's all you had. It was a, it was a strange, strange area where the, ki where the sailors would be aboard these trains and they'd string the, the uh, hammocks right across. Like. Yeah, and it was a, a very nice feeling when I came back to the United States and they met me in Utica Station. Yeah. So who came to greet you when you gave, got back to the Utica Station? Do you remember? Oh, my parents and, and my kid brother, I guess. Yeah. No. Yeah. What did they say it was like at home? Did they tell you what was going on at home at the time? They, yeah, they'd write. Uh, you know, they also I had a, I had an aunt that used to write me every day. And the, uh, I, I don't know what they call them, V mails or yeah, I think they were V mails. Did you ever see one? It's a little mimeograph thing like that. She's sending. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, those must have been encouraging. Those uh, letters. Oh yeah, oh yes. What um, What about when you got back after the war? Did you um, Did you notice things had changed in your own neighborhood, in your own town, because of their their uh, efforts in the war as well? No, I didn't see notice any change. How is it different then than it is today? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Right now, we're split right down the middle. It's sad that this country is in this situation. But I don't know. I don't know. I have nothing but sympathy for the president. He's between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. But at that time, didn't people support the everybody her. supported Roosevelt whether they're Republican or Democrats during World War II there wasn't any dissent then do you think people had a, a good realization of let's say the danger or the reason for fighting the war oh I think they did yeah 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 people were more afraid then beg pardon were people more afraid then and thought they had to fight? I don't think so. I don't think we were afraid that they would fight, but they were. They didn't know what to expect. Yeah, we lived a pretty soft life here in those in those days, right before World War Two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as Tom Brokaw says, well, you do you read his book? Huh? I've read excerpts of his book. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a good book. Yeah. But there, one of the things that I think made uh, these young kids strong during World War II was the fact that uh, they were, had just gone through a depression. And most of these people didn't have, they were struggling to get food, keep the family going. Yeah. Do you think that toughened them up to be able to face what they had to face? I think it makes them stronger, yeah. I think it makes them stronger if they're under 
adverse conditions. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Pearl Harbor. Yeah. What are your recollections of that? Oh God, I was, I was, I remember it was on a Sunday, and I was working on some paper at Cornell, and it came over the radio that uh, Pearl Harbor was struck. Well, we didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor. We just knew Honolulu in those days. But we, we were shocked. Nope. But how, you know how it's, how things have changed since World War II? When this fellow, Casamento, got the Congressional Medal of Honor, they were, had, since everybody was shot, they had the colonel, the Japanese colonel in Japan, write to the people to explain what happened. And he volunteered to do this. Volunteered to come to the United States to do it. This is what uh, is amazing because in those when you were in World War II, you hated the Japanese, <laughs> as you as the and the guys in Europe hated the, the Germans. Yeah, but I think I don't know. Probably that's orchestrated. Don't you think so? The media orchestrates you, twists you a little. When you turn on the t turn on the television, listen to a little of that. Now at that time, people weren't really weren't really watching it on television. They would have the no, it was a radio. Radio had radio didn't have any television. Right, right, right. <coughs> yeah. How did the radio affect you guys uh, in battle? Did you get chances to hear whether it was the propaganda or? Anything? Oh, I enjoyed it sometimes. I used to enjoy Tokyo Rose. And uh, she'd get on the, the radio and, <laughs> and tell you how the, the Marines on Guadalcanal are going to be slaughtered and whatnot. It was it was entertaining. It's a good thing you thought of it that way. Huh? <laughs> it's a good thing, or you would have been really. Uh, oh, I don't think I don't think she affected people that way. <laughs> yeah, but uh, do you no, uh, do you have any? Uh, did you have any buddies who would share any of your stories when you came back? Did you, you know, any buddies around this area? No. 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 Not really. No. How did did your uh, did your family have to make any adjustments when you came back? Did you find you were changed? I guess. How did you change when you came back? How did I change? Did you change? I was four years older. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> All rolled right off your back. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a, <laughs> no. It was no problem, huh? Oh my goodness. But there were but you did meet up you were in units where there were a lot of casualties. There were quite a few casualties in Guadalcanal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember one they thought they were they they thought that they were had the Japanese were going to surrender a certain area, and they sent a, a detachment up to to him, and they slaughtered them all except one or two guys who came back. Uh, and I could tell you too that if you ran across uh, uh, a Jap wanting to surrender, you would say "kimono negete." They take your clothes off. Because we, because we used to carry the grenades, so we used to learn a certain amount of Japanese. <laughs> you had to learn those things. They say "ko shan shariba boko anata," which surrender. <laughs> you didn't know that before you left. I didn't know that at all. <laughs> you learned that in a hurry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> was that I mean uh, you had to really you had to learn some more strategies there how, how much did they prepare you for that for that I don't think they prepared us much because we were pretty we were replacements to build up the division to strength they were not uh, we didn't have uh, many units that you could throw into action at that time 
And the 1st Marine Division was one of them, the 2nd Marine Division on the West Coast in Camp Pendleton. But, um, but we were destined to be in the South Pacific. So it got a little difficult to uh, find there. A friend of mine who would, was on, uh, uh, in Hawaii, he, he was always amazed at uh, things he likes to talk about. Uh, is the Japanese and their strategies and the things they would do, like you were just saying about they'd strap their grenades to themselves. Yeah. What other kinds of things did you notice that they did? You just went, oh, you know. Yeah. You know, the funny thing about uh, my experience over there, I was after came the uh, New Britain campaign, I was back in a place called uh, the Russell Islands, uh, and I ran across a priest who was a chaplain, uh, Joe Ryan, who was an assistant down here at St. Francis de Sales Church before the war. And uh, he was a chaplain uh, in the Marine Corps. And he, he's since dead, uh, but he got some sort of honors by his actions at Peleliu, the campaign after I left. Uh, he went on to become Archbishop of Alaska. That guy did. Mm hmm. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting is how many different things people uh, who came out of the war started to do. How Beg your pardon? The people that came back from the war, how they built up the communities, the things you did to build up the communities. Well, that's true. That's true. Uh, it's funny, I, I don't know if they, these other fellows that get uh, interviewed by you, uh, but I never was part of it. Some of the guys came back from the service and they belonged to a 20, 26, 20 club. Apparently they got so much, $26 for 20 weeks or something like that, and they had a club. <laughs> these are all retired people that get out of service. Yeah. Some have appreciated the camaraderie. Some have appreciated sharing the stories and the experiences. Oh yeah, I, well I do now. When I hear run across somebody has a good story like that, yeah. But uh, what was your rank? Me, I was uh, only a private when I was enlisted, and then I was, and I was commissioned, uh, lieutenant. Uh, I guess I guess I guess before I was commissioned, I was a, a staff sergeant. Yeah. Was that was that important to you to move up? Is that something that you found important? What's that? Did you think that was important for you to do that? Well, you had mixed emotions on it. Yeah. Well, I think you, you always try to improve yourself as far as rank. Yeah. But. Uh, uh, some of the things that I uh, guess I want to get into is. Do you think that, this is unusual, because usually I ask people what, what things were hard and what were difficult, and you, they don't seem to have impressed you, the hard things, you seem to say that, whatever. What did you find about the whole situation? Was there anything that you thought was humorous or just as, uh, great stories that you love to tell that, um, that don't really take us to what is a bad memory, a bad place, but actually good memory? Well, do you think, I think perhaps a human being will, will sort of put the back, my back memories in the background. They don't want to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Did you find that happen to you? Oh, uh, I, no, I don't think I did. I didn't, any, I didn't have any bad, bad memories. I had, had some comical situations. What are some of those? Tell me those. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you can't share them on videotape? You can't share them on videotape. <laughs> I tell you, young lady, if the Marines had tough talking, they wouldn't have been on, they wouldn't have had on ta tape. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Do you but remember your training? What was it like when you went to training? Training? I loved it. Uh, I, uh, 
I didn't like the close order drill too much, but I enjoyed uh, the rifle. I fired expert with a rifle and fired uh, also expert with a pistol and used to be able to uh, field strip or take the weapon apart in the dark and put it back together again. They teach you to do that. Yeah. And even though I enjoyed that, I haven't had a rifle in my hand since I left the Marine Corps. You used your skills for other things. What? You used your skills for other things. That's right. Yeah. Tell us about the end of the war. Now you came back here. Um, but were you, you were discharged before it ended. She's trying to get it. You're running the thing too long. No, it's all right. We're, we're I agree with you. We're <laughs> almost there. Um, what about wh end of the war? Tell me about the, the celebration of it, and did you celebrate the same? No. I wasn't, uh, in the end of the war, I was s still in Quantico. And uh, then eventually he sent me to Cherry Point, North Carolina, which is a Marine Air Station. And I was there until I got out of the service. But your celebration really was in the cities. Uh, you, I've seen uh, videos of uh, them in Times Square and whatnot, but uh, we weren't around there at all. Mm -mm. So it really didn't phase you much? No. So you came home You merely, you mean, what you did was you, well, in those days you were concerned and figured up how soon you could get out of the service. And, and they used to give you credit for how many uh, months you were overseas. I was overseas 26 months. Yeah. And two campaigns. So you quietly came home? Pretty much so. Pretty much so. And then went on with life? Well, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> So, so now more than ever, you prefer to share the stories, but then it was just time to go on. Yeah. yeah. Nobody inter was interested in them anyway. And now we are. <laughs> now, you're, now you're interested in them. Nobody was interested in that. <laughs> if you could say one thing to young people right now, the last thing that you would say to them, and you, um, you really wanted them to have some sense of, be, of the war. And, and you needed them to come out with some lesson. What is it that you could offer them in a lesson? Oh, I think, uh, well, I don't know what to do. With, ch with these kids, I think you, you gotta, they have to realize that they'll be, uh, they live in such a, a good community or a good lifestyle that they owe something to the government to defend the country sometimes. And all of us have that duty because we live a very good life. That's why, it's probably why the, the Muslims dislike us because we do have this type of a life. You think, huh? I think so. Thank you so much for talking. Yeah, thank you. I it's really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you so much. It's <laughs> been a pleasure to meet you. Yes. Well, we got to okay. get that out of your pocket there. Okay. Or we can't. There you go. Thank you, Thank sir. you very right, much, sir. Very I appreciate it. Right. Yeah. Balls yeah. off with yeah. you. Good. Well, it's been a pleasure.